have time to call the meeting to <coughs> order. The invocation. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Let us deal honestly and truthfully with all matters regarding the city. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mr. Powell. Here. Mr. Bronner's absent. Mr. Bishop. Here. Mr. Boehner. Here. Mr. Tommen. Here. Mrs. Kroger. Here. Mrs. Edichico. Here. I'll make a motion we excuse Mr. Bronner. I'll Second. Pay. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> We have a motion by Mr. Boehner, second by Mr. Powell. It's going over here today uh, to excuse Mr. Bronner. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Bronner is excused. Uh, approval of minutes. We have, do we have the minutes from last week and the week before? Okay. Has everyone had a chance to read the minutes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Looking for a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve the minutes as written. I'll motion, second it. Motion to approve the minutes of the previous two meetings as written by Mr. Powell, second by Mr. Tommen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Moving on. Reading. Oh, well, audience participation. We have two who registered. We'll start with the first one Tim Wilkinson. At this point, I have to. I'm going to do it from memory, but I should read the rules. You got five minutes. Say whatever you want with be courteous. Yes. Post. So for the first thing I'm looking for, and possibly, Patrick, this may be helpful for you, is there any way we can paint a arrow on the traffic going eastbound on Columbia towards Reading Road for the left turn lane? Um, the turn lane to the westbound going to that same intersection is painted on the ground. The eastbound lane is not. Um, that was one of my concerns. The other one is, is I prefer a 24 hour heads up before we would close the one way traffic top of Hilltop. I know that the city just recently did this. I didn't know if there's more notification than, hey, we just took a sign up, something on Facebook, something on the city website. Just giving my two cents for that as well. The other question I have is, I don't mind saying our name when we come up to stand at this. Is there any way we can change this that we can give the address to Carla before the meeting or after the meeting to say, hey, I'm going to state my name. Great. But I don't have to give my address. It will be on the record, obviously, but that's my suggestion as well. Thank you, Tim. You know, with with hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sure. the first question was directed to Patrick, Patrick to Arrow. Uh, I was trying to. I was going to ask you, not during the meeting, because I east, I was trying to get it straight, which lane you're talking about, in and between, I don't want to waste time. In between Columbia, or so it's on Columbia, in between UDF and CVS. Heading up the hill? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and second question was, again, change in direction. Cha cha the shutting down of the streets more than 24 hours notice? Correct. So all it was was a sign put up, no notice until after the Facebook post was posted for the notification of the information. Okay. And then the last one was uh, names and addresses of people like you who want to speak. I think that goes to laws and contracts, Mrs. Edichico. And we're working on changing that. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just talking about that. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I don't mind saying my name for the record, standing up here, no problem, just the address. If it's something that we can give to Carla before the meeting or after the meeting, that it's still on the records, just not said at every meeting. Very good. Anything else? We have two minutes left. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Our next one, Mr. Mount, Dwayne Mount. State of mind. My name is Dwayne Mount. I live at 2113, I think. Uh, <laughs> Bolser. Uh, I, I'm directing this mainly to Katie, but since Pat's here, he, I'm sure you have even more of a role with it than uh, there. I saw an announcement today that, uh, or I believe it was today, that they were taking down the left hand turn coming out of the school and they're going to bag it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, and 
Mind you, I'm right there on the corner. I should have had more problems than anybody, and basically I haven't had any troubles. The only problems I ever have is when I want to get out during those times, and I just have to go back in the house and get another cup of coffee. <laughs> but other than that, it's worked out beautiful. Matter of fact, I think I've up, and I've been a, I guess a painful person in a way over the years because of situations, but uh, I am halfway decent, and uh, I have to admit that it's, uh, at least for my part up there, it's gone better than I ever thought it would. But with that being said, 90% of the people don't look at that sign to begin with. An officer, you, your officers will tell you that. They don't even want to go up there because it's a joke. But I think we ought to, you know, if nothing else, save the money on the sign. Of course, we've already spent the money on the sign. But just take it all down altogether because it doesn't stop anything anyway. And now we're back, you know, and if we are going to try to hold them accountable to that left-hand turn and be law-abiding citizens at some point, maybe 75%, then we keep up and down and up and down at one week. I'm not one week, but, you know, we shut it down before. Then people say, why are they shutting it down? Well, shouldn't have been in there in the first place, and they thought it was going to be down forever. Now we jerked it back up you know, for school, I don't, I don't know if it was before school or what. Now it's back up. Now they're giving tickets, and they have given tickets. So those are probably, what, $140, 90 I don't know what they are. Well, I mean, they've been given warnings, but they have been no, given. I mean, I think they're like 25 or 30 for that, but I don't know. Okay, well, I'm just saying they have been doing a lot of warnings in the beginning. But sometimes when the officers get pushed or their people, higher-ups, they're going to try to enforce the law. Maybe not, it doesn't bother them, but they're getting a lot of heat from people like me, maybe. Well, one of the, I mean, we're doing it for the rest of the school year, and okay. it's because of, you know, the great amount of traffic on no. Thurn Ridge and because of the, the major project up there. Um, I will say the reason that, you know, we as a city wanted it leftbound is because traffic could block up in the, on the school parking lot even more, and that is the way that our fire chief mm -hmm. you know would l like to bring a fire truck into that site that's why they didn't put the concrete things down that's why the, the concrete bollards weren't put in w when it was constructed the only problem that does do when they do bring them when they do come out that way there's a l enough roadway to sit in front of my house for a while to kind of alleviate kind of backfills which that we thought that would be the ultimate problem that we could never get out of there yeah. but as the releases go through uh the biggest mess is people still wanting to go left to the highway from Bolser. Yeah. They're actually jumping in between people and they're getting kind of uh, fisticuff attitudes, you know. Let's get out and settle this. So it hasn't happened yet, but I've seen quite a bit of crazy stuff up there. Yeah, just well, short of that. I think the first time we, we bagged the sign, yeah. we also put no left on to bolster yeah. at the scene. We're not going to do that this time because it's no, not they fair. They don't see it. They don't see it. But it's also not fair to the, you know, the people that live up there no. uh, as well. So it, it's not, there's not an ideal yeah. solution I just, up I'm there. I'm just stating that, that I see it more than you do. I mean, we'll discuss, but like I said, that was the reason why the, you know, the, the left turn restriction is, you know, to... The flow, you know, it's easier when you flow, you turn right and you go out. And like I said, I've broken rules before. But when it's right there, and then I'm trying to follow those same rules, I guess uh, when I follow a rule, I want you to follow a rule. Sure. And so that's my only concern. Yeah. But it, there, is a, there is a situation with the traffic coming left that those people, you know, they get a little bit of a testy up there. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm just saying. I just want to let you know how it is. No, I, oh, I know from people. I think people just need to take a deep breath and be more patient with everybody. The reason why I mentioned you is because you had it on the post today. Right, yeah, I had a few people contact me about it, so. I about it, I just wanted to let you know that uh, you were seeming to head the situation and be involved with it, which is good, you know, but yeah. uh, that's why I pinpointed you. Thank you, Mr. Mount. You left 15 seconds on the clock. Any others in the audience would like to participate? Anybody, anybody, come on up. Remember, you almost have to eat that microphone to be heard, so adjust it for yourself. James Shelton, it's 2401 Carroll Drive. Um, I just, I know it hasn't been brought up yet, but I just read the mayor's uh, Facebook post from earlier today. I'm sure I'll bring it up in his report tonight. Uh, I, I'm all for a new track and a new field at, at the stadium, but I was just wondering if you could address if there's any thought to making the field a regulation size 
for both soccer and football if we are going to do any work to it, uh, just because it's kind of pointless to put all the money into it if it's not going to be, you know, full-size field. I think it'd be cost prohibitive to widen it that much for soccer, but no, no, it can be done. It can be done. Well, there you yeah. go. Pat's looked into more than uh, I. You, you beat us to the point. I mean, and yeah. we're in the very beginning stages right. of talking about it, but. Like I said, I think I think most people in the community are 100% for the field turf and to use it more and for a track, uh, or a replacement of the track. But just looking at it through all the discussions and everything, I realize that the field is not a regulation size. So it would likely mean there would be a six-lane track versus a seven-lane track. But having a se six or a seven is no different for a CHL or track meets because most most need eight for a regulation, and there's not room to do eight. Mm -hmm. um, but he's. You're, like I was, there's. I'm not getting that much detail because it's right. it's so very early, beginning. Yeah. But I, I hear you. Yeah, it would it would not make sense to do. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and with the existing track, when we discussed it last, they couldn't do it. So you're right. They would have had to redo. All right. Any other audience participation? We got 45 chairs in here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. Oh boy. Okay. Moving on to reading of communications, Mrs. Kotcher. Um, I did. I, I was contacted uh, by one resident who asked me to read this letter at tonight's meeting. So, members of council, my name is Brian Wilson and I live at 236 Bernard Avenue. I write to ask, I write to you asking for help. I wrote my concerns of this issue to the previous council on 11-17-2020, but never received a response. That email was received and filed by the council. We built our house in Reading in 2018 at the corner of Bernard Avenue and Riesenberg Avenue. When we built this house, Riesenberg Avenue ended where it meets Bernard Avenue. Shortly after building our house, the city created and approved the Riesenberg Extension Project, which extended Riesenberg Avenue quite significantly. I've attached the plans for this project, <coughs> uh, Riesenberg stripping, stripping? stripping, and if thank you, and if you look closely, you'll notice that at the corner of Columbia and Riesenberg, there was supposed to be a traffic sign on Riesenberg Avenue stating that no vehicles over three axles are permitted on this road. Somehow this note from the, engineer, from the engineers of this project was ignored and that sign was never installed. We've asked multiple times as to why the sign was never installed and no council member nor member of the administration would provide a reason why. Prior to my 11-17-2020 email, we, myself and Sabrina Smith, addressed council in person with our concerns of the truck traffic on Riesenberg Avenue. The response that we received in person from council were that the traffic would be only during normal business hours and that we really uh, only were concerned of these issues because you live right there. The truck traffic is literally 24-7. Riesenberg Avenue has had to be patched twice since that time and the truck drivers do not follow the speed limits or traffic signs on the street. I've attached a few clips of semi-trucks speeding down Riesenberg Avenue while completely ignoring the stop sign at the intersection. This is a common occurrence. I have quite a bit of similar video footage which I will gladly send if any more is requested. I can only attach 25 MB worth of clips per email. Trucks will also come down Bernard Avenue, a street that does in fact have many no truck signs posted, and get stuck while trying to turn right onto Riesenberg or just scrape down, the t uh, scrape down the telephone pole at the intersection while forcing their vehicle through. I've reported these issues to the Reading Police Department multiple times, and the truck drivers have been told over and over not to come down Bernard, but they still continue to do so. This specific email was spurred by our most recent experience on the ev evening of March 17, 2022. A semi-truck <laughs> came down Bernard to turn right onto Riesenberg at 10.18 p.m. The truck hit the telephone pole at the intersection and blew a transformer, which sounded like a stick of dynamite going off, and knocked out our electric. Reading Police Department <coughs> were again called and responded to the incident. This video is attached. My 11-17-2020 email was due in large part to the announcement of the business opportunities proposed for the former Dow chemical site. 
I acknowledge that we are very excited for this opportunity for our city, but, the, but that this project will again increase truck traffic to this area. I ask that the council would seriously consider rerouting truck traffic to offer other roads in Reading <clears throat> uh, more con sorry, con conducive, uh, roads in Reading more conducive to semi-truck traffic, namely Cabot Drive and Landy Lane. Again, these concerns and proposals were not responded to. Council Member Gertz did propose Cabot Drive on multiple occasions, but had little support from his other council members. Since my previous email, the Dow Chemical business proposals were approved by the council, and the project will ultimately become a reality at some point in the near future. I'm asking once again that council please consider rerouting the truck traffic from our residential park area to a more substantial, uh, suitable area. There is no reason for these giant vehicles to need to use these streets, Riesenberg Avenue or West Street, when there are multiple, multiple other options available that could be utilized. Please reach out if you'd like any additional information from me. Thank you for your time, Brian Wilson. Make a motion that we file his letter. There's a motion on the floor to, f to I'm gonna say receive and file. Receive and file. Receive and file. Second. And a second from, sorry, that was from Mrs. Chico. second from Mr. Boehner. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Received and filed. You know, in, in response to that, we did <clears throat> talk to the police chief on the 22nd about this issue, um, and Bo talked about the the problems going over uh, Landy Lane or Cabot. It was really tough, uh, but that the chief has gone down and talked to the woman in charge of that uh, trucking company to uh, give them a stern warning, and the tickets would be flowing if they kept up with the speeding in that uh, on Riesenberg, but they're absolutely not allowed on Bernard Avenue. Uh, they have cheap GPSs. The GPS tells them the fast way to go, and they're unfortunately they're foreign. They probably don't know much English, so they just follow the the light where the light tells them to go. Any other discussion? All right, moving on. Guest speakers, we have none scheduled, although one will be assisting. Yep, yeah, put okay. part of my report. Very good. Executive session, none scheduled, no need for one. Moving on. Administrative official reports, Mayor Bemis. Well, thank you, Mr. President. As always, please remember to dial 911 for any police, fire, or EMS emergencies. Um, we've made that change at the first of the year. I want to remind everybody at each and every meeting. Uh, pool signups will be held the first three Saturdays in May. Uh, our pool is, a, is an outstanding deal, $120 for a family before June 1st, uh, $90 for individuals before June 1st, and $25 for senior citizens. Um, cleanup Reading will be held Saturday, April 23rd. We're asking volunteers uh, to go to Canning Park Small Pavilion or to St. Peter and Paul Cemetery, both at 10 a.m. Um, you know, this has been going along on a long time in our city, a, a nice city event. We encourage people to not litter in the first place, but to help keep us litter free and have been doing that for many years and, and encourage that. Uh, our garage will be open uh, from 7.30 a.m. to 2 that day for Reading residents. Uh, please, no hazardous materials, no batteries, no oils, uh, nothing with Freon in it, um, no paint. Um, but anyway, the garage will be open again April 23rd, 7.30 to 2 for Reading residents. Our farmer's market opens Friday, May 20th. We'll be open every Friday until late September. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent place to go, get fruits, vegetables, and, and other things. Uh, Canic restrooms, Canic Park restrooms have been remodeled and look great. Uh, however, I've been told that uh, already vandalism in one of the restrooms. And, you know, we encourage anyone that sees any suspicious or illegal activity, uh, and vandalism being one of those things, to call the police immediately. Again, uh, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., you can call 733-4122. Or if you feel it's an emergency, again, dial 911. But again, a, a down and outright shame here in this community. We need park cameras. We'll be working on park cameras. Um, you know, we can't put cameras in a restroom. You know, it's going to be a difficult thing. 
but a, a down and out right shame that again littering and and uh, speeding and vandalism you know continue to happen and we ask for everybody's help uh, to put that as close to a stop as we can our Reading Community Fine Arts Center is open and we're hoping that everyone will come and see and support this incredible addition to our city the Hall of Grace named in memory of Gracie Lynn Rack will provide a unique venue with elegant ambiance in which to host wedding receptions and other public gatherings uh, the Reading Fine Arts Center also will offer private and group lessons for dance, voice, and theater, and uh, as well as weekly piano and strings lessons. Uh, to get more information, you can call 513-709-7464. They'll, they'll be having classes this summer. Please find out about them. We've been posting them on Facebook, and we'll get them on our web page. Or you can go to Reading Community Arts Center. Uh, dot org. Um, again, if it, our city's going to be safe, it takes all of us. Again, we ask everybody, please get to know your neighbor. Look out for them, and if they need help, help them. And, and if you see anything, again, suspicious or illegal, um, please call our police. Um, anybody that wants to become an, involved in the Neighborhood Watch program, again, we need all the eyes and ears and help we can get. You know, we have Neighborhood Watch uh, program um, programs here at City Hall with our police chief and lieutenants uh, instructing people on how best to act if you do see things going wrong if you want that to happen again uh, please call me 513-509-8619 again as always you know I want to thank everybody who works so hard each and every day to make our city better you know we're, we're very very lucky here wonderful individuals wonderful families wonderful school, school groups church groups um, you know, who, who are just awesome people who do awesome things for our community. You know, I want to also, uh, you know, thank the many, many people who help with Reading Youth Football and Youth Cheer, Youth Wrestling, uh, Youth Soccer, the VYO with basketball teams for girls and boys and baseball and softball teams. You know, the volunteers at all our churches, it's, it's awesome what y'all do all day, every day. Um, again, if people have any questions, comments, concerns, again, I just gave out my phone number, 513-509-8619, or rbemis at readingohio.org, or you can uh, join my Facebook page at Robert Clare Bemis uh, for the Mayor of the City of Reading. Um, and then last but not least, I was given this from St. John's United Church of Christ Men's Group, a wonderful group, very active group, and St. John's a wonderful church. Um, again, sometimes small in numbers, but incredible what they accomplished day in and day out. But they'll have a fundraiser each year for oh, quite a few years now. They give out the Bob Christopher Memorial Scholarship. Bob was an outstanding pitcher at Reading High School, um, one of the main players in the 1946 state championship baseball team, good friend of my dad's, uh, a good, good man, a coach to me. His son played ball with me, good family good group but anyway they'll have food baskets raffle baskets a fun baskets tickets are two dollars each three for five dollars drawing will be held may 1st uh the winner will be called so as you buy tickets um you know you'll put your name and, and number on them um again the phone number you can call is 513-821-1740 dwight that's it for me all righty Safety Service Director, Mr. Ross. Thanks, Mr. Dom. Um, first, a uh, couple things um, from our department reports. Um, this one was, it was really neat to be a part of and witness. Um, there was a cardiac arrest situation that occurred up at Thermo Fisher, which used to be Patheon. Um, they <clears> called <throat> our, you know, they called 911 for us, and on the way, they had a, you know, an employee there that immediately started CPR. Um, person did flatline but the life-saving life-saving efforts of that employee to immediately start CPR and there's a post that you could find on online that uh, the fire department but it, it saves lives when you when you have CPR started right away um, even though he you know when our guys got there he was still flatlining that initial help so we had the victim who was walking around and talking and making jokes downstairs and the employee from Thermo Fisher so it was just neat you know to see a combination of 
you know, employees and our fire EMS guys, you know, like I say, you know, we have the best. So. And Pat, if I could real quick, I forgot. Congratulations to Bruce Thompson, oh, yeah. firefighter, paramedic, uh, firefighter of the year for City of Reading. Bruce, great guy, and yeah. great department. And one other event, it's not really a city event, um, but we're partnering with the, the PTO for Reading Schools on April 30th. Um, they're having a, a you know a PTO carnival up at the up at the schools up there. I think it's going to be an indoor and outdoor event. But we're partnering with them, and we're going to turn it into also a touch a truck event. So we will we will have you know fire truck, ambulance, and public works um, vehicles, police up there. So um, we just want to invite everybody you know um, to take part in that as well. So that'll be April 30th, I believe. It's three o'clock to seven o'clock is the time, but um, uh, I'll post more later. Um, Thurmage Drive. I want to give an update where we are as of today. The sidewalks sh should have been completed despite the rain. They, they had one last um, load of uh, one truck full to get the, the sidewalks done. So all the sidewalks at this point are completed except for the, the, curb, the curb ramps at the, at the ends of the street. So um, you drive down there, it looks, it, it's night and day in my opinion. Um, so they, they have begun the, the curb and apron widening work as of today, they started digging out. They're going to dig out about 500 feet, pour that, then do another 500 feet. Um, they, they started up the Furman Road side of the road on the west side of the street. Um, with that, at the end of the day, um, there will be flaggers up there directing traffic. Um, with widening it, where the truck has to sit, it, it's really, uh, it takes up a, almost all the roadway and cars, even though we've limited it to one way, it's really difficult for them to get through. So there will be times when there's a flagger up there where he will be pointing you in the opposite direction to like, depending on where they are working, they say, hey, please go back to Bolser or go around. So please be patient. They are making great progress, but um, it's, a, it's a major project. Um, Wanted to make everyone aware um, the traffic throw, flow through Hilltop did return to how it was before. Um, it was made uh, two-way, and the intention was to, to keep it two-way through the end of the project. Um, we were under the assumption that the baseball facility up there was not going to be used until 2023. Um, they were able to, to open it sooner, so, you know, you can't have – cars parking safely um, up there with two-way so that will go back to one way that is back to one way there's si extra si more signage now than there was before um, up there um, we apologize for you know how quickly th these are done you know when you have construction projects like this and things going on sometimes you have to make a decision and you, you, you know you would like to have you know a week to advance but um, you know, you have to make changes, you know, sometimes very quickly. And we wanted to get the signage up right away. And the grand opening was going to be tomorrow. It was so going to be tomorrow, and, and that has been, and I know I um, forwarded it to Carla, and I think she sent it. It's been delayed for a week, that the grand opening that Carla yes. forwarded due to, due to weather. I thought I sent it to you to send to everybody. Apparently nobody got my agenda, so now I'm nervous that nobody's getting <laughs> my emails. <laughs> um, I... Uh, one of the early, um, meetings earlier this year, I mentioned MSD's stormwater project on Redding Road and by the pool. That has been delayed probably about three months. We'll have an up, updated timeline, long story short. Um, their bids came back and they were way over, way over um, what the county had budgeted for the project. So they have to go back and rebid the project and <coughs> um, get extra allocation of funding for that from the <coughs> county. Um, and then those things affect, those are going to end up affecting us as well for future projects. He said within two weeks, the price of the piping went up 30% from two weeks. And, you know, and when the project is a piping project, that drastically increases the total cost of the project. So, um, you know, it's the kind of, Hopefully not permanent reality. Hopefully we get back and uh, <clears throat> to better days as far as some of those things and get rid of some of this inflation. Um, as Mr. Shelton kind of brought up, 
Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about capital and recreation needs. I have spoken uh, briefly with the finance chair, and I, I asked him if it was okay if I brought it up tonight, and he said that was fine. Um, so the public works um, is in need of several aging pieces of equipment to be replaced. Um, I would like to work towards getting several of those pieces of equipment replaced, and these are big ticket items. Also, we're run, we've run out of green space in our community. Um, right now, the only green space that the city owns and controls is Koenig Park, Hayfee Fields, and the stadium Bemis the stadium slash Bemis Fields for games, practices, and this is not just for the high school, this is for, you know, youth, you know, as young as kindergarten. Um, Roman Haas Fields and Hilltop were regularly used for soccer, baseball, softball, and football, <clears throat> but both are are not available anymore for use. Um, we're going to look into borrowing funds to, to fund both public works equipment and replacing the track and stadium with artificial grass. Um, fact of the matter is, like I said, field space has is, is gone away. Um, I think it's something that, you know, administration wants to work with council on looking into the details very closely and then getting something done. Every year, every fall, there's approximately 200 youth football cheerleaders. Um, every fall and spring, there's 250 to 300 youth soccer players. And in the spring, right now, VYO has 24 softball and baseball teams. So these are not high school kids. These are our little kids. And, and then I will tell you, finding room to practice and have games is extremely <laughs> difficult. There's we oftentimes have to say you, you can't practice, you can only practice this day. Um, and then when you deal with weather, it becomes even more difficult. Um, so this is something I think we as administration thinks is gonna be a benefit for you know, young kids now, but it's gonna benefit everybody from all the way from kindergarten all the way through, through high school. Um, I think it's a good investment. I think you know, we have the 340 fund, which after this year opens up significantly. Um, and I, I think financially we can make this happen. And if you have a facility that you can play on in all types of weather and it's already lit, you could rent it out, which could offset some of our costs as well. So um, I wanted to bring it up here tonight, get the ball rolling, and maybe at a um, council of the whole, get into it even further <coughs> for that. And I also did mention um, the, the track would be done at the same time. And this is, the track is, you, I mean, if you go down to the track any time of year, you will see young people, old people, um, see, not CEO, but the project, the site manager for um, Avicia. We were down there last summer for when, when Redding had to do their graduation down there. We were just going over some of the logistics. And here's, you know, I don't want to mention his name, but here he is walking. You know, so it is something that's used a lot, not just by um, sporting teams and track and field. It's used by community members year-round. So I think, you know, um, there'll be a lot of discussion about this, but I, we as administration think it's worthwhile and, and looking forward to discussing it further and, and hopefully moving forward. Um, we had a meeting last week with um, the Dow and the Port. Um, we had our public works there and our engineers, they had several questions um, regarding potable water and storm water for the site. So we wanted our engineer and our water guys there. Um, right now their, their slated demolition to get the site ready is um, they, they, they're hoping by June, July to get that site um, totally cleared out. Um, one, one more thing before the last one. Um, Sabrina and I have mentioned for several meetings in the past um, about um, presenting ordinance for new software for our payroll and our finance so um, probably at the next meeting we will present this to you guys for a first reading so we can get that ball rolling because it is a long process of them implementing you know so we would like to get it done in a way that come January 1st of 2023 that's up and running correct Sabrina yeah um, because it's the current one's going to go away in June of 2023, so it's going to completely die on us. So to be able to have it implemented and have our department heads trained on it, which they were part of the process of going through all the 
you know, three different vendors that we did as well. So just drilling you up on that long process, Patrick and I have been doing multiple things to get ready for this smooth transition as it can be. Plus having it on a calendar year, which is our budget year, will be important and having it a clean line for payroll to be able to transfer over will be important because we'll actually have to do both systems at once. <laughs> So. And uh, finally, I, I asked um, the last part of my report, Rich Serace, is it Serace or Saras? Serace from Energy Alliances. They've been our broker since before I was here. Um, it's for gas and electric aggregation. As council remembers, you guys authorized um, legislation to give me the authority to sign pricing for the gas aggregation project. Um, I, I asked Rich to come because he's he can explain it in a way better than me, but long story short, we haven't executed that yet, and he's going to explain why and kind of what next steps for the better, you know, for the best of the community. So. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Council. Uh, so, as, as Mr. Ross said, um, back on March 1st, uh, you did approve for him to move forward on signing an agreement uh, for 24 months or less for a price not to exceed 56 cents per CCF. And uh, you know, at that time, everything looked great, right? We, we've historically lumped Reading with over 20 other communities to try to get the best pricing, trying to look at that sort of pool rate. And, uh, you know, the main thing holding up things at that point were having to get to the, you know, kind of a threshold, a threshold of volume. And uh, that threshold was hit on the night of March 21st. So the intent was that we were going to start calling everybody the morning of the 22nd and say, let's execute. Well, over that night, the price had moved up over 3%. So we kind of blew through the threshold. Um, and it hasn't stopped since so the prices just continue to move higher i mean i think we've all seen that just commodities in general much higher right the, the price of gasoline has been jumping all over the place and uh you know natural gas has not been shielded from that at all so you know i had shared with mr ross and, and i'm not sure uh, uh if Ms. catcher had shared uh, a piece that i had put together earlier today just kind of laying some of that out but as of right now we have not executed and uh, actually our recommendation at this point is that we let the aggregation program expire in June. So every resident or small business that's on the program would still be at the 39.6 cents through June. But at that point, we actually let it expire. So why do we make that, you know, that, that suggestion? We're heading into the summer when everybody uses gas the least, right? So if we're going to take any risk on volatility, let's do that when people barely use any gas. Um, you're looking at the next five years, and so, so gas is traded on a futures market, looking at the next five years. Uh, right now, as of this afternoon, it was at the highest price it's been in over the last six years. So if, you know, if I came here today and said, hey, let's execute, I'm pretty much saying, you're buying the high, right? right? But really, we want to focus on kind of the winter. So again, the suggestion is to let the program cease come June, and then what would happen is that Constellation New Energy, who is the current supplier, would start to drop all the accounts in May. So everybody, you would still be on their bill for June, but then by July, they would be back paying Duke's standard rates, uh, which are variable. But again, uh, we feel that it's a risk worth taking at this point because the volume that people use is so minimal. Um, and then we'll continue to watch the market over the next couple of weeks, months, whatever it may be, to look to see if this market will give us anything back to try to lock something in for the winter. So um, as I had put in that report and as I talked to Mr. Ross, it, it may be any time from today until August 12th to say, you know, we, we may move. I mean, if this market wants to give us anything back, we want to be able to jump on it. So that would be, you know, be the plan. Um, so I would expect that the, plan, that the program would start again no later than November. Uh, but again, if the market wants to give us anything that started earlier in the summer, uh, we'll, we'll do that. But really, again, our focus is trying to get things in for the winter because really between October and, and March is when people use roughly 83% of their usage. So, that, so that's the time period that we really, we really want to protect. Um, if, if we're lucky enough that between now and Monday, uh, the market decides to collapse and we get below the 56 cents, Mr. Ross will get a call from me and, and we will execute plan A. But uh, you know, we wanted to definitely start those conversations well ahead of time to be prepared for plan B or even plan C if you know, if the market just does not behave for us any longer. And again, you know, wanted to make sure I came tonight to give, uh, you know, give you a chance to ask, ask, her, ask any questions and, and be able to answer anything uh, that may have come up. <coughs> question, question from Mr. Powell, go ahead. Uh, I guess this might be the question for our law director. The ordinance that we passed 
say the rates come down in the summer, is that ordinance still valid as long as the price point is below? Uh, Dave, I'd have to take a look at okay. it. Okay. Uh, you know, the bottom line on it is, is that if 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 we anticipate that the program is going to expire, we're going to need a new ordinance anyway. But okay. I think we'll we'll deal with that as it comes. Gotcha. And then, uh, so you, it, looking in the futures markets uh, as you get into the summer. Are you seeing that the rates are getting more reasonable in the future? So, so what's happening right now, so the market's in what's called backwardation. So the next couple of months are very high, and then next year and the year after that are much lower. So the, the curve kind of goes like that. So the idea of the aggregation is to you know, sort of lock in some of the lower prices for you know, next year and, and part of the year after that so that the average brings it down to a reasonable rate. But the next, we'll, we'll say June, July, August, September, those prices are very high. So when you play this you know, weighted math game, it keeps the price very, you know, elevated. So the idea is that we'll try to replace the high prices the next four months with the four months of summer of 24 that, you know, that will then bring that, that overall average. So again, you know, we were very close to executing, and I think if the market gives us back even a little bit, um, you know, we'll still want to take advantage of that because I, I think that window of time of executing will be very small because when you're in the spring, you kind of get to that window where, the market is not longer no longer worried about the winter, and they're not fully worried about the summer just yet. So they give you like a little bit of time to kind of, you know, get the rest of the year set up. So again, that's why I'm here tonight to kind of talk about that. And if there have to be any changes, to, you know, to ordinances or language or anything that we could do that to to find that window of time. Now, as natural gas, you know, I know petroleum itself is more of a global commodity. Is natural gas in the same? So. Uh, what's going on in Russia affects the price here, or is our gas mainly produced domestically? Um, so, so most of it is domestic, okay. um, but it, it is becoming more of a global commodity. Um, with the development of LNG, liquid natural gas, they can now take it and put it on a pipe, on a off the pipe, put it on a tanker, and they can send it overseas. And that's actually uh, a little bit of what got us in this predicament in the first place. Is for the last couple of years, prices were very cheap. I mean, the aggregation we're coming off of was, is, is very cheap. So what happened is that the producers who did produce, you know, they did what they could here, but if they could send it to Europe or China, you know, or anywhere else, and the market was willing to pay them $10, but the U.S. market was willing to pay them two, they put it on the boat, right? And they, they sent it over and they did that. So that, that kind of messed around with the U.S. supply demand a little bit. So we, we are seeing that it, it has become more of a global commodity um, than it was even a decade ago because of that ability now of, and just the change of, of doing and things. Have, have more of the countries uh, overseas, like Germany, have they switched their ports to be able to handle the boats as opposed to getting their stuff via pipeline? Um, so you're seeing a slow changeover, even here in the U.S. I mean, it, we, there's only, I, I think there's less than a dozen facilities across the entire U.S. that can do it. So it, it, I think it's a growing thing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see it grow a little bit more in Europe, especially you know, with what's happening in the Ukraine and with Russia. Uh, Europe is very dependent on, on the oil and gas from Russia through pipeline. So I think they're going to look for options, right? When you don't have options, that's when you get you know, really damaged on price. So I could see some of the you know, coastal countries look to see, you know, hey, do we, you know, do we take on a facility to give us more options when, when things like this happen? Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Just, just clarify, based on your recommendation, we'd be on a variable rate through Duke throughout the summer until, what, roughly November? Yeah, I think. Unless we get a, a favorable price. Correct. I mean, and, and we say November, um, it actually would start in October. So just like the, the electric and the gas opt-out letters would go out no later than August. Oh, I guess it would be September for an October start because the plan would be we want people to be on the program starting in October. So when they get their bill in November, which would have that usage, they're already paying the, the locked-in rate. Okay. So yes, we will be at a variable price, and you know it is Duke's rate. It is you know it was 85 cents in April. Um, I are, I am seeing some things that, that there's a few different pieces that go into their price that their price may come off a little bit in the summer. Um, but again, when you're when you're multiplying that number by a very small number, I mean I, I estimate the cost difference for somebody's going to be roughly four or five dollars compared to last year on their gas. And I think most people won't even you know, see that when they're paying hundreds of dollars on the electric side during the summer months. Thank you. Other questions? I have one. 
Um, I think you mentioned businesses. Was that limited to small businesses, or are you talking about aggregation also for the larger businesses? So, so any business, so any, any account that is a, is a classified as a, a general service, so on their bill it would say GS for general service. Um, they anybody using less than five uh, anybody using less than five thousand CCF is eligible for the program. Any residential account who's not already shopping um, is on it. But as far as businesses. Anybody using less than 5,000 CCF, which is actually a you know, pretty good size number, would be eligible for the program. Very good. Anyone else? Thank you. Good. All good for you? Yep. Thank okay. You. I do have one question for you, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> doesn't involve gas. No, I just have some. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> except, except for cars. Um, what's, what's the status of the uh, traffic study on Galbraith? for stop signs? Um, we have not completed a traffic study yet. Um, I, I didn't know council, this, I didn't know council would like a traffic study on Gatworth. There are residents along there who would like to see stop signs as I mentioned a few months ago, but we'll, we'll I'll, I'll get back with okay. you on that. All right. Moving on, law director, Mr. Stevenson. I have no report, thank you, Mr. Don. Treasurer's report, Mrs. Owens. Thank you, I do have one. I have our um, income tax receipts for March. The total collected was $775,881, which is up 37.6% from 2021. This is made up of $131,391 in individual collections, $434,394 in payroll withholding, and $210,097 in business net profits. That is up 788% over 2021. Um, our total collected to date for 2022 is $2,096,752, which is up 6.5% over 2021. There is a part of me that would love to just sit back <laughs> and enjoy these um, wonderful numbers for March. Um, but, um, I mean, both for the benefit of Reading and for our Reading businesses. Because if our collections are up, then it means that Reading businesses' profits are up. So, um, you know, I would, I would love to just sit back and enjoy that. But um, I don't think this is a trend that's going to continue. So I just, I think, that we're in the middle of tax filing season. So I think that we just kind of need to watch. I think things will settle down, especially on the, the net profits um, line item. But it certainly is exciting to look at 788% increase over, over the last year. Um, and also, I would like to just make a, a final reminder that tax um, returns are due on April 18th. And if you have a federal extension that will extend your Reading tax return, this just extends the filing. It does not extend the tax payment. So if you do feel like you'll have a tax payment due, then that is still due on April 18th. We have several options for filing. There is electronic. Um, you can uh, download a, a paper return and mail it, or if you have any questions or need any help filing your return, you can come in and we will help you file it. And that is all I have tonight. Any questions for Mrs. Owens? Moving on, auditor's report, Mrs. Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to say that our 2021 20, um, audit is mostly complete. Of course, they have a rebuttal and they can talk to us about more documents requested, but we've given them everything to date. Um, still working on 2021 items to finish up. Um, so I'm gonna be getting with Patrick soon just to make sure we've gotten everything that they're requesting or um, other things that might be outstanding just to catch up. Um, all that stuff will be due um, kind of the <coughs> beginning of May, so that way they can finish up and file for us. Um, so that's a two-year audit and also a gap statement. Um, for 2021, so that's why there's two parts to the 2021 audit. Um, of course, that's happening in 2022 right now. Um, everything's been fine thus far, so 
Um, I'm very happy to report that. That takes a lot of man hours and a lot of help with all our different apartments um, from, you know, tax, water, police, fire, service. Um, so it's a lot of work. And so I just appreciate ever, everybody helping with that. And then as far, I think you guys received my reports from February. There was an issue in closing from the bank. So I had to make sure that that was fixed. It was an error on their end that we found um, from one of our banking sources. And then that was fixed. So that's why you got February later. Um, I didn't want to post and just like let it sit there because it was their fault. So you got February and March. So we're streaming into April. Um, and then as uh, Mr. Ross talked about, getting that new financial system will be super helpful because right now um, I have to enter in everything that's turned into me. So I'm doing a lot of data entry. So that'll be helpful once we get that um, done. And I think that's all for tonight, unless you guys have any questions for me. Questions? All right, moving on. Council committee reports, finance. Mr. Bronner is not here. Utilities, lands, and buildings, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first, I want to thank Patrick Ross for uh, updating the website with all of our contact information. Uh, it's nice to have that on there for people to be able to reach us. Um, and also for his reports on the streets uh, and, and projects that are, that are happening around Reading. Um, on Tuesday, March 4th, uh, the Utilities, Lands, and Buildings Committee held a meeting to discuss the feasibility of implementing the Unicity Public Wi-Fi program and see if we can identify a path forward. Um, the program would benefit the people of Reading by providing free Wi-Fi access while also complementing the Reading Bridal District and the proposed DORA. Uh, in attendance were myself, uh, Mr. Powell, and Mr. Bronner. Um, we had some invited guests, including John Putnam and Ryan Satsker from the Unicity Project, uh, Nick Diederich from the Reading Bridal District president, uh, and Jennifer Burke, the treasurer of the Reading Community, Community Schools. Uh, it was very helpful. Mrs. Burke provided a summary to help identify where the most need is in Reading. Uh, and Mr. Diederich offered to work with the Reading Chamber of Commerce to see if we should move forward with the project with their help. Um, the meeting was held in Council Chambers at 6.30 and ended at, promptly at 7. Uh, I want to thank everybody who attended and contributed to the discussion. Uh, the next step we're waiting for is to await feedback from the Chamber um, and its members to find their, about their willingness to participate in the project and see if we need to go forward with it. Um, I did receive two communications fr uh, from residents in my ward. Uh, one from Mrs. Ingram on Columbia Road, which was forwarded to me by Mrs. Chico, and also from Mrs. Sturgill, also on Columbia. Uh, both were expressing their, their hardships faced with the fiber optic installation construction work in front of their homes on, on Columbia. Um, I replied to both residents and assured them that the asphalt patches and sidewalks were temporary and the restoration and cleanup would be done when the installation is complete very soon. Unfortunately, construction is a ne necessary but uh, messy business, uh, and I would encourage everyone to not only be patient, but also be more cautious when walking or driving in the areas while construction is in progress. Uh, Columbia is a somewhat unique situation, primarily since it's steep and narrow and bends around uh, with even steps in the sidewalk. And as Mr. Ross has mentioned previously, the work is being done on Columbia is in the uh, public right-of-way where they're installing the fiber optics. And uh, the Chief of Public Works reviews these plans when submitted, and he has been in contact regarding restoration work um, when it is completed. So, um, thanks. Thank you to Mr. Ross for his updates on that project too. Faithfully submitted, Mark Bishop. Any questions for Mr. Bishop? Mr. Bishop, is there an uh, estimated timeline for a completion date on the fiber optics? No, I do not have one. Okay. Uh, I got a comment on that. Talking to the Chief of Public Works, uh, one of the things that they when this project was in the planning stages, they let them know when the spring break was going to be. Uh, unfortunately, the marking of utilities was drastically delayed all the way up and down Columbia, and that's why they haven't gotten down the other end of Columbia yet. Uh, so I would imagine that that's pro project's going to be delayed even further by the time they get down past the school. Uh, I don't know what kind of timeline they're talking about at this point. Anything further? All right, moving on. Zoning, planning, and environment, Mr. Powell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, at our meeting on March 15, 2022, Mr. McKenzie of 404 Flora Avenue 
asked some questions about his driveway and its relationship to the public right-of-way of Flora Avenue. I researched the right-of-way and this is what I found out. Flora Avenue was relinquished to public use by James H. Oliver on August the 3rd, 1855, and at the time was noted as Brewery Street. Being that the right-of-way does not appear to have ever been improved to public standards, my opinion that the portion of Flora Avenue east of 5th Street is dedicated but not accepted. I visited the site three times since our last meeting and have not seen any evidence of vehicles accessing the park via the gravel driveway. I've also been looking into the issue of blocked railroad crossings and feel that there's not much that we can do as a legislative body uh, that will make a difference. The only legitimate authority that can regulate blocked crossings is the federal government. Federal Railroad Safety Authorization Act of 1994 is the main source of the railroad industry's contention that state and local laws are not enforceable. I found that multiple times in the past, the uh, Federal Railroad Administration has been requested to begin making the rulemaking process to determine effective measures to regulate blocked crossings. No action has been taken further. At this time, I request that every time you observe a stop train, go to, and you can do it on your smartphone <coughs> or via computer, uh, www dot fra dot dot gov forward slash blocked crossings and make a report uh, you can turn on your location services it will pull up a map you can click right on the crossing and it has a, a link to file the report right there um, other than that i will continue to look into the matter any questions for mr powell yeah, yeah i got one dave um in Lachlan, uh, many years ago, they passed an ordinance. Uh, if the train is blocked more than, I think it's 30 minutes, there's a citation issued to the train uh, of $60. And also, they agreed at that time uh, not to have a train more than 250 cars uh, because it's a real issue in Lachlan. Uh, that's where the fire happened the other last week. And um, they routinely put more than 250 cars on. We don't have as big a problem here uh, in Reading because it's uh, really just they take empty trail, rail cars back and forth. But in Lachlan, it's a huge problem because they block all the crossings in Lachlan when they're trying to change over to another train in Sharonville. Uh, with the length of trains now, the Sharonville rail yard is too small for what they're trying to do. And until they figure out where they're going to move that, Lachlan and the rest of us are all going to have that same problem. Yeah, I think the best thing is to keep the pressure on them one way or another. You right. either call in the number or reporting. Um, I think the mayor of Lachlan said that they've been cited, I think, 85 times in the past two years and they haven't paid any citations yeah. ever. So, um, yes, it is very difficult to enforce and to even, especially on our end, change anything. When Jim Brown was mayor, they were paying regularly. He, 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 he knocked it to them every time. Um, I don't know how they got around the rules to get that passed and make it effective, but... Uh. Bob, we all had, uh, all the communities had uh, block crossing ordinances years ago, and the Sixth Circuit said that uh, we couldn't enforce them. And that happened in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, we had situations here where we'd had every crossing from North Street all the way through Galbraith Road blocked for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a situation uh, back before that case came out where uh, a train stopped and the engineer got off and went to McDonald's for lunch. Right, right. Uh, and, was, and, and cut the crossing at North Street and Columbia and, and Mechanic. And it just, it's, yeah, it, it, the cases uh, are really, they really don't say what the, railroads say they say but you know the bottom line is is that every time we try to enforce it or any time any community tries to enforce it they bring up that Sixth Circuit decision and it goes away um, well I know in Lachlan an hour or two hours is nothing there's been 10 12 at one time is 16 hours where people had to go all the way to Galbraith Road or all the way to Glendale Milford just across in the Reading mm-hmm 
Well, it does. It actually does impact us because it, it one it will cut off our access to Lachlan and Interstate 75 via uh, the most direct routes. But then also we're providing services to Arlington Heights, and if that train has basically divided Arlington Heights in half, there's part of it that we're you know we cannot serve. We've got to go around or depend on other apart departments on the other side of the tracks to serve on our behalf. Yeah, thank God for mutual aid. It's. But this has been going over with United States senators and representatives for years with little change. You know, the railroads are very powerful. They're also very productive in many ways. It, it's just a shame to me they're not more efficient or more conscientious. But again, traveling to Florida back and seeing all the semis on the road, I guess we should thank God for what does go via rail. It's again, it's just something again, Mark Mason took over and and uh, had Sherrod Brown and Rob Portman involved and not even they can get a lot of results. So, Mr. Powell, I do have a question. Yes, uh, what it sounded to me from what you read that Floral is a city street, correct or not? It has been relinquished to public use. That is correct. So that means then that the city could pave it. Theoretically, yes, we could come in and improve the street up to public standards. That is correct. Mr. It is our right of way. Typically, the streets are improved before we accept them. You would improve it, and then, like Dave said, it is accepted. Well, yeah. So the dedicating bottom, and accepting are two different. That's correct. We're not required to accept a dedicated street. There are a number of streets in Reading that are dedicated but not accepted. Some of them are even paved. I happen to live on one. Um, but the uh, um, there has, was a number of mechanisms for dedicating public streets years ago. Uh, uh, at the time frame that you were talking about, all a guy had to do was draw it on a plat, and that was it. Correct. Uh, but, you know, the bottom line on it is is that our practice here has been to not accept streets unless they are up to our standards. We have made a couple of exceptions on that on major streets, but other than that, I can't see us doing that unless Florida is improved. So that sounds like something else that could go to laws and contracts. Yeah, you could look into that. Give her a couple million dollars and she might even yeah. solve it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Powell, are you, is that good for you? you yeah, okay. that's fine. All right, speaking of laws and contracts, Mrs. Edichico. Thank you, Mr. President. I held a laws and contracts committee meeting on March 8th. In attendance was Mr. Powell, Mr. Boehner, and in the audience, Mr. Bishop, James Shelton, John Malott, President of the Chamber of Commerce, Nick Dietrich, President of the Bridal District, Donna Wiggins with We Thrive, Daniel Hurst with Images by Daniel Michael Photography and Chair of the DORA Committee with the Bridal District, and Chief Edens with our Police Department. DORA stands for Designated Outdoor Refreshment Area and allows for certain areas of the city to be exempt from open container laws. The Bridal District is proposing a DORA along Benson Street. We discussed expanding DORA along Reading Road to Valley Tavern on the north and the library on the south. The DORA can be up to 150 continuous acres. As of right now, this layout is only around 40 acres. We can expand or decrease the area as needed, but it must be continuous. The benefits of a DORA district is it can attract more business to the city, such as restaurants and entertainment establishments. It also attracts more out-of-town patrons. We have a lot of people who come to our bridal district, and the hope is to have them stay and eat and drink and enjoy our city after they're done shopping. The reason we're looking at expanding along Reading Road is to develop that area with more restaurants and new businesses. Expanding it north can also help the farmer's market grow. Adora will also allow more events to take place in the area. And looking to the future, the I-75 overpass is slated to come down within the next five years or so. That leaves that area by the Mill Creek prime for development and having Adora can help move that development along. Chief Edens has talked to other communities that have DORAs and no issues have been reported. 
This is promising because a big concern is people walking around with open containers, possibly causing property damage, or just the idea of intoxicated people walking around and causing trouble. Knowing that other communities haven't had any issues eases these concerns. <clears throat> the proposed time frame the door would be open is noon to 10 p.m. every day. We can change this time frame if needed. However, this looks like a good starting point. Those who partake in the Dora would receive a bracelet like the kind you get at festivals and a Dora specific cup. These would be purchased at an establishment that sells alcohol. The next steps are the bridal district is operating under the Chamber of Commerce and is working on gathering letters of support from businesses in the area and liquor, liquor license holders and will complete an application before they submit it to the city and to council. The application will be made available to the public between 30 and 60 days via newspaper and the city's website. I'll also post it to my Facebook group and have the city posted on their Facebook page. After the, public after the public notification, my committee will write a resolution to be brought to and voted on by council. And that's all I have. Any questions for Mrs. Edichico? As far as the door goes, mm -hmm. um, would that uh, like circumvent the need to get a, like a temporary liquor license, say if we were to have a, a street fair or something like that, or is, is that independent? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think would... the street fairs are independent is what, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Um, no, that would actually help um, for the Fall in Love. They do get a special liquor license for that event, and I believe that if we have a door in place, they won't have to do that. It'll, it, if it's in that district, they don't have to get a special liquor license. So, like, we used to have the, the taste of Reading on Benson Street. Mm -hmm. As long as the alcohol is being sold by somebody with a permit. Yes. See, that, that's where if the bridal district wanted to sell, they would have to get the special permit. Okay. Yes, if it was outside. just that alcohol, right? Like, if, if one of if one of the one establishments of the up and down Benson Street were set up a booth, and I, I mean, I, I've been to Beale Street in Memphis, and that's a great <clears> big Dora, and you know they sell it right out the window, and you, you walk up and down the street with it. So, thank you. Any other questions? Moving on, service, Mr. Boehner. Just exactly like that. Well, thank you. Did you miss uh, Mrs. Kroger? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait. Oh. No, Mrs. Kroger's at the end. Sorry. Recreation's at the end on this list. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. No, go ahead, Mr. Boehner. Okay. Um, <laughs> before we get started, we're going to have a service committee meeting uh, next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. in the caucus room. Uh, I'm emailing Mr. Bronner since he's on vacation. Um, I've got the Chief of Public Works report for the this this week city crew has been out patching potholes in the streets the mulcher has been out collecting branches and city crew repaired the fire hydrant at Reading and Galbraith city crew replaced a storm door at the Mill Creek Alliance building at Jefferson and Walnut city crews are replacing signs throughout the city that has been faded or damaged city has approximately 600 tons of road salt left in the salt bin which is a good uh, savings in the, going into next year. City crews have been out cleaning catch basins. Caney Park has a new facelift, looks very nice, and shelter and restrooms. The restrooms had a complete makeover, uh, unfortunately, until the mayor reported that they were vandalized again. City crews are starting to get soccer fields ready for play. City crews are getting all the city parks ready for usage and spring activities. City workers are starting to work on the new salt bin. Sewers were repaired in the alley between Jefferson and Church Street and Pike and West Benson as they were starting to fail. City crew repaired the chimney at the health building as it was falling. City crews trimmed some trees on Reesburg near the soccer field and uh, Chief of Public Works must have a direct line to heaven because he says the plows and spreaders have been removed from the big trucks. So I guess he doesn't think it's going to snow anymore. <laughs> I'll have to check in with him. All parks and restrooms are open at this point. And that's all I have unless anybody's got. I, I will talk to Patrick. Uh, I had an idea uh, about starting up a special capital account for the service department. But after what he talked about tonight, I'll talk to him further about that next week. Any questions for Mr. Boehner? 
All right, seeing none, Shelly, I apologize. My eyes skipped a line. No problem. Please go. All right, so our run count for the police department for the month of March, uh, the calls for service were 1,288, um, 28 auto accidents, 193 <coughs> booking of original charges, and then a total uh, criminal charges of 290. Um, and there were exactly 300 citations written. And that is between Hamilton County, Arlington Heights, Juvenile, and Reading Mayors. For the fire department, EMS responses was 206. Fire responses were 44. Nine of those were an all call. Total responses of 250. Um, again, I would like to congratulate Bruce Thompson also um, for being Firefighter of the Year. And Health and Public Safety Committee will meet on Tuesday, April 19th at 6 p.m. in Council Chambers. Sorry, what was that date again? April 19th. 6. 6. six. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yep. All right, very good. Any questions for Mrs. Kroger? Did See. you want to take um, the Riesenberg and discuss that at the committee meeting? Or? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Nope. All right. Last but not least, recreation, Mr. Tommen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, fortunately, Mr. Bemis and Mr. Ross covered most of my uh, report. The only thing remaining is that the city Easter egg hunt will take place on Saturday, April 16th at 10 a.m. at the Hafey Field House. Any questions for Mr. Tommen? All right, moving on. Other business. Is there any other business? Seeing none, moving on. Legislative session. I didn't see any legislation in email. Did anybody bring any? No, it's just a second reading. Second, second reading. Okay. Appropriations. Yeah. Mm, that's an order. Uh, mm -hmm. I have no resolutions on the agenda. Okay, ordinance. Uh, second reading, an ordinance to make appropriations for current expenses and other expenditures for uh, of the City of Reading, State of Ohio, during the period ending December 31st, 2022. So second reading only. Has everyone read that, the, the full thing? All right. Can I just give a little background for people? Yes, home? please. Uh, so basically, this is how I spend money throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, we also settle it up. So Patrick produces this document, again, checks and balances. He's checking the work that I'm turning in, making sure it's valid, and also doing that budget preparation. So that's what this is based off of. And we presented it to the Finance Committee um, before coming here. So that way, you guys can have a chance to look at, a, at it. So a lot of times, as we discussed, um, there's a way to do it where you can do the year ahead of this time, but because we've seen the market, two to 7% have been rising in costs for every bill that you might have. So even our phone bills went up, but hopefully with some of the new contracts that the mayor and Patrick are working on for different vendors, we can help drive that cost down a little bit um, for different items. So Patrick's working on that with Bo as well. Uh, but because we didn't know what the expenditures would look like, he wanted as much that we knew in the beginning of the year to be able to happen before we made the permanent appropriations. So the temporary was passed last year so I could spend money up until you know the end of April. And so now that's why we're doing this. And we're giving a lengthy amount of time so you guys can look at it. Um, and if you have any questions, they kind of mirror the report that I give you every month as well. Um, but if you have any further questions of that, I can give you individual line items. And that's also all posted on Ohio Checkbook as well. So, and that's been updated through March as, up to today, so. Sabrina, is there any need that we would have to pass this tonight or? No, there's no need because the temporary carries us over. Um, so, but Patrick and I talk about these numbers. It's like lives in our brain, right? Um, so, and then also the department heads play on this for their operational budget, you know, which there's discretionary spending. And as we talked about before, we don't have much of it, you know, so we buy our supplies in bulk. We buy our supplies, multi departments. I'll get recs with from staples that have nine different cost centers in it because we're all sharing those resources. So other questions for Mrs. Smith. 
All right, seeing none. Uh, miscellaneous business, anything miscellaneous, Mr. Uh, Bishop. <laughs> Bishop. Bishop. <laughs> I don't watch. It'd be if Mr. Browner's not there, I almost called you Browner. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I was saddened to learn tonight of the of the passing of a longtime Reading resident, uh, Mrs. Uh, Francis Jean Mink, uh, wife of Dean Mink. Um, our prayers go out to Mr. Mink and his family, and her family. Um, they they were neighbors. They're neighbors of mine, so um, they meant a lot to me. Um, new business. We have new business in Reading. Uh, a uh, ministry that was located in Roseland before has moved to Reading. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the grand opening and ribbon cutting ceremony for the Agape Love Ministries on Saturday. Um, they're located directly across the old, the old Carousel Inn on Reading Road, at the just at the the border of Reading. They're in Reading, uh, along with uh, Sunday services. They provide a drive-through food bank, uh, where you just drive through, open your trunk, and they fill it with food. Um, apparently, um, <laughs> they uh, they they open their doors for access to computers for youth in the afternoons. Um, for to school for schooling, um, they offer youth mentoring, um, adult uh, counseling, among other services like marriage counseling, things of this sort, as ministry would. Um, but they they want to offer their service to the community at large, and uh, ask people to come take advantage of it. Um, it was great to meet and talk with Reverend Henderson, as well as Sister Tanya Key, who's also a council member in Lincoln Heights, um, as as it turns out, um, and many of the other people that were there. Uh, the Vice Mayor of Cincinnati was also present. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed meeting everybody, and I welcomed them to the great city of Reading, the crossroads of opportunity. So we have a brand new church in Reading. You want to do some advertising for <laughs> Reading? <laughs> 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 Mr. Boehner, did you have one? No, I was trying to make sure you, you pronounced Mr. Bishop's name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say Brunner, and I was going to correct him. <laughs> Sorry, it's all the bald heads, you know. <laughs> we got one over here copying, you know. All right, Mrs. Smith, you had something. Uh, yeah, I have a couple items. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking at Mrs. Pletz's up at Reading um, Community Schools at her seventh and eighth grade ladies leadership class today. So they meet during lunch. Wonderful group of girls. Shout out to them. Thanks for you know caring and you know figuring life out being a young lady. So I appreciate going up there and just having some fun activities with them. And then also, I just want to switch to the We Thrive kind of a couple updates. Thank you to our mayor for talking about the farmer's market that starts again on May 20th. Um, but I also wanted to give an update that the We Thrive group has kind of made a, um, a website to kind of help with community things. And it can eventually be worked in um, as a possibility, which we haven't discussed it yet with our current website here at the city. Um, so that's something awesome. WeThriveReading.org. So we're going to be taking comments and suggestions on how to kind of encompass all the great things that are going on in Reading. You know, sometimes we have scheduling issues because we have such great things going on in our community and we just want to be able to support them all. So I appreciate that. I'm also taking sponsorships for Park Passports. It's $40 for the year. So you would do one of the locations here in Reading. Um, I already have six sponsored. Thank you for that. And I need eight more sponsorships. Um, and that's where kids go around Reading. Kids can be all the way up to 17 years old. Um, and they collect etchings from different city landmarks and city parks. And then they also go um, to Vonderhaar's and get a free ice cream cone for that. Um, that's an update from there. And then look for, on social media, I'm going to be doing the Adopt-A-Pot again. Um, as a hand gesture, I'm reaching out to the previous people that did it last year in 2021 to ask if 2022, but I probably will have some openings come or maybe some consolidation. Um, but if you're not on Facebook or social media, you can always call my phone at 513-733-4879 or call the city hall main number and ask if you want to be a park passport sponsor or you want to adopt a pot. I can put you on that list for that. Um, and let's see here. I think that's it for me for tonight. Thank okay. you. Okay, this side of the house. Miscellaneous? No, nothing? Okay. That ends miscellaneous business. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Boehner motions to adjourn. Second, Second by Mr. Bishop, not Bronner. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned.